Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the non-applicable clauses, permissible exclusions, exemptions webinar, uh, developing a better understanding of what can and cannot be excused in an audit assessment. My name is Joseph Prolikowski, and I am the QMS uh, Program Manager for Perry Johnson Registrars. A couple of presentation notes for everyone. Uh, all of our participants are on mute, but we absolutely want to address your questions. So please utilize the question portion of the dashboard. We will address your questions at the conclusion of today's presentation. One of the more common questions that we get is, will this presentation be available uh, later? And the uh, answer to that is yes. Uh, we will have copies of the slides available for download shortly after we're finished. Uh, and if you want to review this webinar with voiceover, uh, you can visit our website, go under webinars, look for previously recorded webinars, and that will take you to the link for viewing it again with commentary. Our topics for today, we're going to discuss uh, what non-applicable clauses are, what that phrase means. We're going to discuss uh, the high-level requirements that apply, and they actually come from several places. We're going to hit upon uh, a critical aspect of this, which is outsourcing, and we're going to delve into uh, outsourcing as it is presented in both the 2008 and 2015 versions of ISO 9001. We'll touch on the impact of a limited scope, a couple of concluding remarks, and then your questions. Uh, just a special note, uh, for today's presentation, we're going to be presenting uh, these concepts as they appear in the 2015 version of ISO 9001, uh, as well as its predecessor, 9001-2008. Um, now, this concept of non-applicable clauses uh, does appear in other standards, uh, AS 9100, IETF 16949, and so forth, uh, but there are sector-specific requirements in those cases. Um, now, I would like to note that we do offer webinars on all three of those standards and other uh, standards, so I, I do encourage you to visit our website um, if you wish to learn about uh, some of these different standards. <clears throat> so let's begin with non-applicable clauses. Um, the concept is primarily rooted in Clause 4.3 of the 2015 version of ISO 9001, uh, where it reads uh, in part that the organization's scope shall state the types of products and services covered and provide justification for any requirement of this international standard that the organization determines is not applicable to the scope of the system. So that's where the terminology comes from, not applicable clauses. Um, 4.3 also requires that the scope, uh, including details and justification for all non-applicable clauses be maintained as documented information. It's one of the few uh, items in the standard that still requires uh, that it be firmly documented. Uh, quality policy, quality objectives are a couple of the others, but you, you have to have your scope firmly established. Um, you need to uh, draw the, the lines of distinction, so to speak, what's the activity, what's the um, uh, physical space and so forth. And within that, you need to define what are the non-applicable clauses, if there happen to be any. Now, a little bit of historical information. Um, if you go all the way back, actually, to the 2000 version of ISO 9001, um, the concept uh, for uh, those eight years uh, from the 2000 version to the 2008 version uh, was permissible exclusions. Permissible exclusions, that terminology appeared in Clause 1.2 of the 2008 version of the standard, and the wording um, was similar, where any requirement of this international standard cannot be applied due to the nature of the organization and its product, this can be considered for exclusion. Uh, so we came up with the this phrase, permissible exclusion. Um, in section 422 
of ISO 9001-2008, it was established that the organization had to maintain a quality manual and the exclusions and their related justifications had to be documented within the quality manual. So that was uh, the basis for uh, us asking about permissible exclusions. Where's your quality manual? And let's see that you've covered permissible exclusions. So because we have these two terms, permissible exclusions, non-applicable clauses, um, for purposes of our presentation today, uh, I'm going to use the term exemptions. Exemptions is an innocuous term, doesn't appear in the standard, um, so we can use that as kind of a collective term uh, for this uh, concept that we're going to dig into here. So let's put exemptions in plain English. Um, you know, if you read the verbiage from 9001, 2008, or 2015, they're both essentially saying the same thing when it comes to exemptions. Uh, for an exemption to truly be justified, it has to be something that is not part of the organization's quality management system as defined by the scope. Uh, so let's dig in and get a better, uh, a better sense of how we need to understand that requirement. Uh, and we're going to start with a review of the high-level requirements. And as I mentioned, these come from uh, a number of different places. Uh, first of all, the TC-176 committee. Now, TC is technical committee. <clears throat> and the uh, TC-176, this is the group of folks that wrote the standard, that wrote ISO 9001 itself, both the 2008 and 2015 revisions. We're going to get into some of their guidance in just a few minutes. Also, the ISO 9001 Auditing Practices Group, or APG. Uh, this is a joint task force representing both the ISO and the IAF, the International Accreditation Forum. Uh, they have something to say about this. Obviously, the 9001-2015 standard has content, uh, both auditable content and guidance content. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm going to be including a couple of things from the uh, guidance standard, the ISO TS 9002, uh, which is called Quality Management Systems Guidelines for Application of ISO 9001-2015. So we've got a lot of, of industry items here that we're going to point to to kind of illustrate our points and uh, help you understand uh, the expectations for this requirement. So let's begin with the TC-176 committee position papers. Um, now, when the, the 2008 version um, of the standard was published, um, uh, shortly afterward, uh, it was published in September. In, in October of that year, um, the TC-176 committee issued uh, two officially binding guidance documents. This was a, a somewhat unusual step for them to take. Uh, to issue these uh, uh, guidance documents. Uh, they were referred to uh, officially under the heading Introduction and Support Package. And the two documents that were uh, issued at that time uh, were referred to as Guidance on Subclause 1.2. You may remember that that's where the concept of permissible exclusions is discussed, and Guidance on Outsource Processes. Now, taken together, uh, those two papers included a requirement that a lot of people found controversial at the time. So what was so controversial? Um, the, uh, the guidance documents had various uh, permutations pertaining to exemptions, uh, but one item in particular stood out as being uh, a controversial idea. So let's let's take these phrases here. Uh, so from guidance document 524R6, this is the one that was written for section 1.2. Examples of situations where conformity to ISO 9001-2008 should not be claimed include where an organization excludes a requirement on the basis that the activity has been outsourced. And then from uh, guidance document 630R3, this is uh, the one written for outsourcing, the intent of section 4.1 uh, of ISO 9001-2008 is to emphasize 
that when an organization chooses to outsource, either permanently or temporarily, a process affecting product conformity with requirements, it cannot simply ignore this process and it cannot exclude it from the quality management system. So in other words, if you outsource an activity, you cannot claim that activity as an exemption. It, it is not an acceptable exemption and it should result in a nonconformance during the audit. Um, now this is guidance from the committee that wrote the standard. There's, there's simply no getting around it. Now the obvious elephant in the room in all this is design. Um, PJR, uh, we've had clients in the past that claimed an exemption from design and development on the basis that designs were provided by their parent or sister company. Now those exemptions um, are potentially not appropriate and should not have been automatically accepted. We're gonna be providing some clarification on that uh, in just a few slides here. Uh, talking about design, uh, there are two basic justifications for exempting design. Number one, complete product design is provided by the customers. Um, and number two, an organization that does not manufacture products based on a design. So warehouses, distributorships, service companies, uh, and so forth. Now there is a third option that we're gonna be exploring uh, in just a little bit, but basically, um, if you don't interface with product designs uh, at all, you should be able to exempt it, but uh, we're gonna dig into what this means in terms of outsourcing in just a few slides here. So the obvious question here, how can PGR audit something I don't do? Uh, we get this, uh, from our clients and our auditors in some cases. Our auditors will contact us, how am I supposed to audit this? It doesn't happen here. Well, what you have to remember is that we're not auditing the actual activity. We're auditing the outsourcing controls that are being applied. And that's where outsourcing is such an important aspect uh, of what we're going to be uh, dealing with here. So what is outsourcing? Um, outsourcing is a key concept and it's defined in the fundamentals and vocabulary document ISO 9000 uh, as follows. To make an arrangement where an external organization performs part of an organization's function or process. Now note the phrase the organization's function or process. That means that the organization still has ownership of the function or process, even if they're not doing it in their facility. Now that point gets further emphasized in the note that appears right after that definition. An external organization is outside of the scope of the management system. So in other words, we're not going to go to your parent company, we're not gonna to go to your subcontractor and perform an audit, but the outsourced function or process is within the scope. So we're going to look at the outsourcing of design, we're going to look at the outsourcing of calibration uh, or whatever it is you have outsourced that falls within um, your quality management system. So what are some examples of outsourced processes? Um, uh, these are uh, processes that uh, organizations choose to outsource, whether it be for cost reasons or for specialty reasons, you know, if, if you don't have the capability to do something and so forth. So, I mean, some of you on the call, you may do more than one of these. Uh, calibration is very common to bring in a laboratory to calibrate your measurement devices. Uh, training, very common. Uh, order entry. Uh, this is something we might see uh, a parent company doing for its satellite location, design, purchasing, manufacturing even. We have this with companies who have products manufactured uh, overseas, and then the products are then imported and uh, distributed from the headquarters facility. So you are, in that case, outsourcing the manufacturing. Uh, product testing, uh, using a, a laboratory facility uh, for testing purposes and even something 
uh, like non-conforming product disposal. Now I've paired each of these with the respective clauses from ISO 9001-2015. The, the idea, of course, is that just because you have outsourced the activity, you would not be excluding um, any of these clauses uh, in that particular circumstance. So where is outsourcing discussed in the standard? Well, let's begin with the 2008 version. Um, it is primarily discussed in section 4.1, um, where the organization chooses to outsource a process that affects product conformity, the organization shall ensure control over such processes. It was, it was covered in, in rather short order in the 2008 version. In 2015, uh, it was covered a bit more thoroughly, um, and it was also treated as a part of a larger picture. Uh, outsourcing is now uh, part of the bigger picture of what we call external providers. And for external providers, of course, the primary uh, clause is going to be section 8.4. And I've pulled the verbiage specifically from 8.4.1 here, that the organization shall ensure that externally provided processes, products, and services conform to requirements. So that's a fairly inclusive list. Uh, I've also put up here the definition uh, from, section, uh, from clause A8, that's the annex, of course, in ISO 9001, where it's defined that any form of external provided process, products, and service are addressed in 8.4, whether through an arrangement with an associate company or outsourcing processes to an external provider. So in other words, if you're buying raw materials from somebody, that's an external provider. If you're sending parts up the street for plating, that's an external provider. If you're bringing in a training company to train your staff on uh, driving a forklift, that's an external provider. All of those things fall into that category um, as defined by uh, Annex A8. Now, outsourcing is also discussed um, in some of the high-level requirements that I mentioned a few slides ago. Uh, the 9002 guidance standard uh, states that uh, external providers could include the organization's corporate headquarters, associate companies, suppliers, or someone to whom the organization has outsourced a process. That last bit, that last bit is rather inclusive, isn't it? Um, the auditing practices group even weighed in uh, when they wrote their guidance document for scope of ISO 9001. Uh, it stated that outsourcing is to be considered an input to the development of the organization's scope. So um, outsourcing as a concept, um, they're all over it, so to speak, uh, the folks that write the standards and interpret the standards. Now remember, when we audit the outsourced activity, we are not auditing the actual activity. We're not traveling to your parent company. We're not traveling to the laboratory. We are confirming that controls have been established. So what do we mean by controls? I've, I've mentioned this now uh, a couple of times. What do we mean by controls? Well, any methodology of control that you would apply to an external provider should be uh, generally acceptable. So what are some of these methods? Well, we might include contracts, having a contract between yourself and your external laboratory, a purchase order. Purchase order can specify expectations and so forth. Uh, email communication, having a general terms and condition document, um, traveling to the external provider and performing an audit. Um, requiring the external provider to be certified uh, to ISO 9001 or to some other appropriate standard. Uh, even something as rigorous as providing work instructions to the external provider. All of these could be considered a form of external provider control. For example, Let's consider a company that chooses to outsource 100% of its calibration verification to a outside laboratory. So what is the auditor gonna be looking at? Well, we would look at perhaps the contract that's been issued to the calibration laboratory. 
we would look at the calibration records that have been provided by the calibration laboratory. We would look at the gauges themselves and look to see that they are labeled uh, from the calibration laboratory. Now, none of that equivocates to a review of the actual calibration verification activity. And in this scenario, none of the clauses from ISO 9001-2015 that pertain to calibration verification would be claimed as an exemption. You would have all of 715 be applicable and we would audit the controls that you've applied to that activity as an outsource process. Now getting back to uh, design and, and the larger picture of exemptions. Um, we have trained our auditors and the members of our executive committee to review a client's website as part of the audit process. Um, bear in mind that your website is considered admissible as audit evidence. Now, when we're looking at the website, we're looking for a couple of, of key things. Number one, does the website appropriately reflect the scope of certification? So in other words, if we have issued you a certificate for manufacture of injection molded parts, and we go on your website and we're seeing discussion of uh, recycling services and delivery of uniforms, that's gonna potentially be concerning because it's not what we certified you for. Um, and also, uh, does the website reference design activity if by chance the organization is classified as no design? Now, if we note that there is design on the website and the organization has been classified as no design, uh, we will reach out to the organization and get an explanation. And the explanation usually falls into one of a few categories. Uh, corporate provides the designs. Well, we've learned now that it's not acceptable for you to claim design as an exemption if you're getting designs from your corporate headquarters. Uh, we don't really provide design services. We want to attract potential customers by saying we do. Um, we can understand the desire to grow a business, but unfortunately that explanation isn't acceptable either. Uh, the website and the design classification have to be aligned with each other. Third example, admittedly rare, uh, we did design our products, but 30, 40 years ago. Uh, so it's a, all a series of legacy products. In that particular scenario, uh, generally we're going to have to take a close look at the situation, follow up with our auditors and make an informed decision. Now I mentioned uh, that we were gonna look at exemptions rooted in a limited scope. Um, now, most of the clients that we have, uh, when they approach us for certification, their intent is that their entire operation is gonna be included. Uh, they want uh, everything in the building, so to speak, to be included in the certification. Uh, that said, we do have uh, a small percentage of clients that want to have a limited scope, whether it be for financial or for other reasons. Um, in situations where an organization has a limited scope, in some cases it can mean uh, certain areas of the standard may be considered for exemption that would not have been possible in a full scope situation. So here's an example. Let's say that we have an organization that manufactures clothing uh, for both industrial and for commercial markets. Um, so we'll say that they manufacture leather goods for industrial application and polyester goods for commercial applications. Now you may remember that ISO 9001 2015 um, has warranty provisions uh, in section 855. So let's assume that the organization in question here has warranty return provisions for their uh, commercial products, but not for their leather products. If this company were to approach us and say, we only want to be ISO 9001 certified for our leather um, product line, for the industrial product line, it's possible uh, that they'll be able to claim a full or partial exemption from Section 855 because there is 
uh, no warranty provision uh, for the industrial product line. Again, we would have to look at this very carefully, work with our auditors, but it is possible. So what happens if an inappropriate item is claimed as an exemption? Well, the, the most appropriate result of an incorrectly claimed exemption is a nonconformance. Um, we looked at clause numbers a little bit earlier in the presentation. Um, now, if a nonconformance is issued, um, I want to just reassure you that you do have the right to issue a dispute or an appeal uh, of an auditor's decision. That process is discussed in PGR Procedure Pro 10. Pro 10 is available anytime uh, for download on our website. Now, uh, mid-2017, uh, we rolled out a new certification option uh, for clients who receive some or all of their product designs from a parent or affiliate company. And that new option was referred to as full design outsourced. Now, we had a couple of things that we established for a company uh, classified in that manner. Uh, first, and, and perhaps most importantly, the on-site audit time is potentially uh, going to be calculated in the same manner that we would use for a client classified as no design. Now, we're going to cover uh, what we mean by that in the next few slides. An organization that is classified as full design outsourced does not claim any part of the design section of the standard as an exemption. And the certificate that's issued to the client will indicate design as part of the scope statement. So a couple of uh, provisos. Now, when we rolled out our full design outsource classification, we actually reached out to ANAP, uh, the primary accreditation body here in the United States, uh, to make sure that they were uh, uh, okay uh, with the direction that we were taking. Uh, now, ANAB indicated that they felt what we were doing was appropriate, uh, but they emphasized uh, that controls must be applied to outsource processes and that those controls have to be included in the audit process. So I've uh, pulled a couple of quotes uh, specifically from our, our communications with ANAB. The complexity, activities, and risks that are present due to an outsourced provider of processes, products, or services need to be controlled and confirmed as discussed in ISO 9001-2015, Section 8.4. And also, Section 8.4 of ISO 9001-2015 has many requirements that apply to the organization and have to be confirmed or evaluated by the certification body when certifying an, outsour an organization that has outsourced products, processes, or services. So essentially, ANAB was saying to us, look, okay, Yes, you can go with this classification option where it applies, but you've got to exercise some rigor in looking at the controls uh, over the outsourcing. Now, ANAB went on to say that they objected to an automatic time reduction based on product design status. In all cases, the certification body is required to clearly, effectively, and realistically justify and document justifications for any adjustment from the established audit day tables. Now, audit, audit time, you may or may not be aware, comes from a document called IAF MD5. That's Mandatory Document 5. Uh, that particular document is uh, public domain. You can Google it and download a copy for yourself. Um, in other words, we cannot be expected to reduce audit time uh, for classifying you as full design outsourced unless we've been on site and have concluded uh, to our satisfaction that the controls being applied to the outsourced activity are mature, highly effective, and can be assessed with no added audit time. In other words, um, there's a mature process in place. And uh, only then can we look at reducing audit time for the fact that you've outsourced the design activity. So we are required to treat full design outsourced and full design as um, equivalent in terms of total audit time until such time as we're assured that the outsourced controls are mature and effective. So 
We now have four classification options pertaining to design status. Um, I'd like to review these options now over the next several slides. First, and perhaps most obviously, we have full design. Um, an organization that is responsible for the design of at least one of the products that they manufacture. Uh, in this case, of course, all clauses uh, and subclauses within Section 8.3 are going to be applicable uh, for a company classified as full design. We also have no design, an organization that receives all designs from their customers or otherwise does not interact with product design. So like we mentioned earlier, a warehouse, a staffing company, and so forth. In a no design certification, uh, all portions of Clause 8.3 are claimed as not applicable. Now, special note here, if the organization receives product designs from parent or affiliate companies, but does not have any responsibility for product design and does not advertise or otherwise represent that they are responsible for product design, including on their website, they may, emphasis on may, also qualify for classification as no design. We also have a classification option called partial design. Uh, this is uh, seldom used. Uh, it is intended for organizations that provide technical input or review or verification to their clients, but they do not typically have responsibility for final design approval. Um, again, we have very few clients classified in this manner. In a partial design arrangement, the expectation is that some of the sections in Clause 8.3 are going to be claimed as not applicable, uh, but not all. There's going to be something in Section 8.3 that applies to you, whether it's design review or design inputs or some combination therein. And then full design outsourced, uh, an organization that receives all or some of its product designs from parent affiliate companies or subcontractors and advertises or otherwise represents that they are responsible for product design activity. Uh, in this case, all sections of Clause 8.3 are responsible, uh, are applicable rather, for the companies that have been classified in this manner. So in conclusion, uh, PJR is very much interested in ensuring, in ensuring that our audit process is value added to our clients and addresses all applicable requirements. Making sure that exemptions are justified uh, is part of this process. I'd like to invite you to tune in for one of our other uh, webinars. Uh, two of the other webinars that I host include our ISO 9001 2015 webinar, uh, we've updated this webinar in recent times with feedback from uh, years of auditing it, as well as feedback from the 9002 guidance standard. We also have a presentation on statutory regulatory requirements um, and how that impacts the audit process. And as I mentioned earlier, we have webinars on all kinds of other things, process mapping, stage one audits, IETF, ISO 1345, and so forth. We'd love to keep, uh, keep in touch with the, all of you, and the best way for us to do that is if you opt in for automatic updates. Uh, you can do so by visiting our website at www.pjr.com. If you go to the bottom of the page, input your email address, and click subscribe, you will be opted in uh, for automatic updates on uh, upcoming webinars and other points of information. I do thank you for your time and attention to my presentation. I'm going to go ahead and unlock the question portion of the dashboard. Do we have any questions today? Okay, thank you all for your time. Have a great day.